swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. My name is Graham Brown. Listeners, I've got a question for you today. What does it take to make your heart beat faster and how do you make a dent in the universe? To help us answer those questions, I'm joined by a 16 times Ironman finisher, three times Ironman World Championship qualifier with Aloha Sized Dreams, people consultant, coach, and now freshly minted professional triathlete. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sports business, 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 business. all the way from Vancouver, Canada, Steph Corker. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Graham. Great to have you here. So, Steph, just before we get started, I know you're based up in Vancouver, Canada. You've just come back from South Africa on one of your latest adventures. I think we should start there. Talk about your your journey going down to (laughs) Ironman South Africa, your first race as a professional triathlete. There's a lot going on there. Can you give us a quick, short summary of how it went for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I think it's fair to say that I dove into this world of of racing as a pro exceptionally naive because um, a girlfriend here in Vancouver was um, plotting to race in South Africa. And I thought that it would be a really great first rookie race. Um, I I thought that there wouldn't be many people that would show up in South Africa and that I could you know, sort of undercover my my first pro race, and it couldn't have been farther from the truth. Um, of course, the world record holder was there, and exactly. uh, quite a dynamic European field. Um, so, yeah, I I went to South Africa. Um, is, <laughs> I'm just laughing at myself because I think of all of the places I, I could have chosen to go instead. Right. 30 and hours of plane travel to get there first off the bat, hours. right? Yeah, I mean, that was been, I was really nervous about um, the trek. I've I've flown Vancouver to Asia, but 30 I haven't I hadn't done 30 hours and I had my bike and um, I was just worried about spending so much time in a plane and you know some other um girls that I had spoken to that had done the race talked about blood clots. And, um, I thought, Oh gosh, you know, what am I getting myself into? And all of that to be said, it was the most wonderful experience. And I've been home now for two weeks and I think it's taken me two weeks and, you know, every day, really, I am just so insanely grateful that that was my experience. Um, I was on the other side of the world. I didn't have a data plan on my phone, and it it made me realize how much we rely on just communication. And you know, I didn't have Wi-Fi. I wasn't, you know, I, I was there on a bit of a solo mission. And um, I, I just I've come home, and every day I'm reminded, like, what would the Africans do? Mm. Because the race took place in in a little town called Port Elizabeth, and we would see lots of locals and and in through little communities, and you know they didn't have the most aerodynamic bikes, and they didn't have brand new running shoes, and they travel distances that North Americans don't do every day, and we have so much more available to us. And seeing the kids, I mean, there were there were these large groups of kids out on the bike course, and I just thought, there's no way I'm giving up if these kids can be out cheering all day long just thinking this is the coolest event ever and so you know the truth is that I'm really proud of my result and my sponsors might not be very proud and it might not have you know looked very great on paper I was the last pro to finish the day um yet I finished it was the best time and for an early season race for me Um, I'm just so grateful that I went and I didn't give up and, uh, I hope it's the beginning of, of more adventures and some more travel and maybe not 30 hours of travel (laughs) and really, really great perspective of just how lucky I am to, to pack my bike around the world and do something that is still but a dream. Yeah, exactly. And there's so much going on there as well. There's so much, 
I guess there's so many different emotions happening as well. When you went to that race, you, you know, you had expectations. I love that bit that you just said that you were planning to go to South Africa because you thought it might be a bit under the radar <laughs> where you could, but you know, then the world, you know, Daniela Reef turns up, right? And so it's kind of like a pretty tough field already. It wasn't, you know, like a backwater Ironman. This is well competed. And you did it, was it 10 hours and one minute? I think I was 10.04. Okay. All right. So you just, I mean, you just short of 10 hours, right? So, I mean, you did, it's a pretty amazing time. I know you said you were the last pro to finish, but let's have a look at that. Firstly, you finished and a lot of pros <laughs> don't finish, as you say, because, you know, they don't want to look like they're, you know, at the back of the pack for the sponsors and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people, you know, don't get through the course, but also compared to the age groupers, I mean, I did have a look at the age group stats as well. I did take the liberty in that. You were 22 minutes ahead of the top age grouper in your division. So, you know, if you were still amateur, you would have been well ahead, right? You would have been 20 minutes up the field. So it's, I think it's all about perspective, right? Where you've come from. Yeah, you know, you totally. You had a pretty awesome race. You know, now you're comparing yourself to professionals rather than where you were the race behind, right? So yeah. It, it's such um, it's such great perspective, Graham, and it's real. You know, you, this is how you put it. You can be at the top of the amateur race or the last of the pro race, mm. and there was only twenty percent of the whole field, amateurs and pros, were female. Right. And there's such a wide spread in the female race, and and I think the. It, it really calls us, especially as women, to show up and to toe the line. And, you know, someone has to bridge the gap. Someone had to go from being the first amateur to the last pro. And, you know, on that day, two weeks ago, it was me. And I'm totally okay with it. Um, I just hope my, my sponsors and, you know, my, my coach and my tribe will, will stick by me because it's not going to be the last race. And, and I hope... You know, it won't be, maybe it will be the last time I'm the last pro. Well, that it's the last be- time you do 30 <laughs> hours of travel, maybe. <laughs> I, of course, they're going to stick with you. It's a journey, isn't it? And this is just it's the first journey. step on that journey. I'm, you know, you've, you've gone from being the top amateur to, you know, the last pro. You've sort of stepped up into a new division. And a, a lot of people won't make that step because it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, I like being the top in my division and mm. I don't want to now compete in the bigger league because, you know, I, I don't want to be at the bottom and work my way up again. But you've willingly mm. put yourself there. So you seem, I don't know if the word comfortable is right, but you seem comfortable in that situation where you're sort of, you're now climbing a bigger mountain and you're starting at the bottom and working your way up again. That seems to be something that I don't, did you do that by design? Do you enjoy being in that situation? Hmm, I haven't, I guess I didn't really look at it like that. Um, as much as. Is it the um, challenge? I mean, did you enjoy being almost like a, you know, starting from step one and thinking I've got to get up this ladder again now? Yeah. You know, I really think of, I'm not artistic at all. Um, unless, you know, I like to think that cooking is my only form of art. But beyond cooking, I I actually think sport is is a version of art. Hmm. And it to me it just feels like full self expression. Like it's less of a challenge and more of I just don't feel like I'm done exploring exploring some potential. And I think the most beautiful way to express potential is is through sweat and start lines. And, um, maybe because I haven't been an Olympian or I haven't been, you know, at the top of a, of a sport yet in my life. Um, I don't feel like I have much of an ego to be honest associated with it. So I'm less attached to winning or losing. And I'm much more excited about the race and I'm much more excited about the, the training journey and, You know, to me, the race is just an opportunity to, like, fully express yourself. I love the competition. Um, I realize that not everybody is friendly on the start line, and that's okay. Mm. Um, I'm super game. You know, I want the best of my competitors because I want to race them. I wish them to have a great day, and and I want to have a great day, too. And, like, let's see where that that 
you know, lands us all at the end of the day. Um, and that's not to say, I mean, I- I'm going to play fairly. I'm going to play by the rules. I want you to play fairly and I want you to play by the rules and let's compete, you know? And, and so I don't, I think I, it's not for me as much about amateur or pro as, as much as it is about just an opportunity to, to get out there and be our best. And right. it sounds so cliche, but I think until you're in it, then you recognize it's not cliche at all. The opportunity to give up exists a hundred times a day for everyone yeah. in every form of life, you know? And Well, you, you're, um, you're somebody, I mean, you know, from what I understand and what you've told me already and what I've read, you're somebody who really sees competition in the positive light. You know, you see this kind of competition as a way to get more and better out of people personally each everybody's a winner in the sense that they can can become a better person through this kind of competition right and there's a little bit of you know negative competition during the games itself but i guess a lot of it afterwards is sorted out and it's all cool right but you've been in situations like for example let's talk a little bit about your your business your day job so to speak which is the, the corker company you have this fantastic relationship with your brother matt who is the co-founder of this business and you both work together and you have you know this great relationship where you support each other and it's a very unique and rare relationship in business as well and that gives you that kind of confidence to be competitive as well because you can only see it as a positive thing as well so tell us a little bit about that setup where you and matt are working in this business because i don't think many people will have seen siblings in business together as co-founders hmm. yeah i i know of a few but not many and <laughs> we right. do deal with a lot of founders so it is an interesting dynamic it's a dynamic that i'm really grateful to have for sure um what i would say i mean one of the best things about matt corker is his ability to do set really hairy audacious goals and do whatever it takes to go after them and it, by default, that's what we do in our business. That's what we do in our personal lives. And when you know that about someone, then I, I feel like we're almost in the practice of failing every day. And yet there's a moment in time where failure becomes success. And then you start to get wins and that momentum keeps moving. And that's really what the business has been. You know, we've learned a lot. We set quarterly business goals and we failed at many of them. And yet we've also succeeded at a lot of them. And um, my brother is my absolute number one Ironman fan. He's been to <laughs> way too many races. And um, I, I mean, I would just say that I'm like the most proud sister for all of the endeavors that he's embarked upon. And so when you're in a partnership where there's just there's so much respect, there's clear direction of where we're going and why we're in this business together. I I think it trickles over it's the same respect you have on start lines it's it's the ability to be in the constant practice of of failing or innovating or iterating and um i think that's what's made it work for the last few years to be honest and it's what's kept us both really engaged about creating a future mm-hmm. um together in this business you know as entrepreneurs entrepreneurs i think you get to a point where you're like should i look for another job is this going to actually are we actually going to make a go of this? And every Monday morning we look at each other and high five and are like, giddy up, we're Mm. doing this. So, yeah. So you you put yourself in these situations where you can fail and you will fail inevitably at some of these things, right? That's just part of the process. And, you know, you learn and improve and whether it's becoming a, a professional triathlete or, you know, starting your own business, you take risks a lot more risk than the average person would take. But then you've got these people who have your back, you know, mm-hmm. that you you get this feeling that, well, you know, I'm covered. I've got somebody who's going to look after, not necessarily look after me, but support me or, you know, maybe mm-hmm. give me encouragement or something when I'm not feeling 100% because I'm not a robot. You know, some days are up, <laughs> some days are down. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about those people in your life because – you know, you seem to, you are very much a people person. Your business is a, a people consultancy, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, you talk a lot about leadership and inspiration in your blog as well. I'm curious to sort of delve deeper into that riff with you about these kind of people, you know, this network that you've built in your life, in your business, 
in athletics and so on. Mm -hmm. Where do we start? Let's talk about those people first. Yeah, sure. You know, I think there's something really special about your inner tribe. And, um, you know, there's that awesome phrase that your vibe attracts your tribe. And I think that's cool and everything's energy and there's only so much of it to go around. So I hold, you know, a few relationships very, very close to my heart and I'm really grateful for their influence and, you know, for, for those people in my life. And of course, my brother being one of them, my husband is my hero. Um, our parents have been, you know, exceptionally um, supportive along this, along the journey of, of many pursuits. Um, I have a really tight relationship with my triathlon coach, Jasper Blake, and, and you know, we have a great relationship in that, of course, he programs, you know, when I swim, bike and run, yet we're also really always dancing on this fine line of when I'm exhausted and when I'm excellent. And, mm. um, you know, I think, I think I'm probably one of his athletes that he just shakes his head at, like, oh, no, like, what are we up to next? <laughs> and I think it's important to have those relationships that he's, he just has this belief of like, yeah, like, let's go for it. And you can't only have a team of yes around you. But when you get to sort of that, that skinny point of your potential, you want the people that really will believe in the dream, whatever the dream is, um, just in your corner when the going is great and when it gets tough. And I have some really awesome training buddies and, and it's, I'm just, I'm really grateful for, for who's inside because the entrepreneurial hustle and the life of being a pro triathlete now, it's not really normal. And there's lots of opportunities for me not really to fit in. <laughs> right. But you've chosen uh, to stand out. I Well, I guess I've just journey, and I don't expect anyone to understand or want to be on it per se with me as much as, um, as much as I just don't want to conform to anyone else <laughs> <laughs> i think we all share that slightly weird outsider perspective but we get it we get the vibe right i like what you said you said there's only so much to go around i'm thinking about your energy and your time so mm. you know you are must be extremely busy you're not you're a professional triathlete you're also a coach you're also a co-founder of a business you also write on your blog etc and travel 30 hours to races all over the world so you don't have much time to go around are you very conscious about how you give out your time are you very protective how do you sort of work that because i imagine being an entrepreneur you get a lot of people knocking at your door there's a lot of opportunities you know come and meet me for a coffee let's talk about this opportunity and you know i, I want you to come and present to my business all that kind of stuff right yeah. how do you yeah. deal with that how have you sort of learned and become better in sort of guarding your time and you also your relationships yeah uh, um it has been a it hasn't been easy and it's been a work in progress most definitely and i would say that now and maybe it's taken until 2017 um i feel really good about it i i has, you know i'm unapologetic with my yeses and my nos mm. um i never do anything i don't want to do and I don't stay out late and I don't eat crappy food. Um, I also don't drink alcohol and it's really just that simple. Um, for a long time I was worried that people would judge me or think, you know, like I'm the weirdo that always goes to bed before double digits. And <laughs> the joke is that if I can make it till 10 PM, it's a big deal. Um, but that's just the way it is. And, and I'm totally okay about it now. Mm -hmm. So and the people around you as well, I suppose, share that kind of outlook as well, that they understand that, right? You're not surrounded by people, oh, come on, Steph, let's go out for a drink type situation, yeah. right? So it's not a problem, right? You have very sort of strict discipline about your own life, and the people around you, I suppose, are pretty disciplined as well. I noticed you said that you, um, you know, you swam a lot as a, as a kid, right? And mm. you said that the discipline you learned from swimming is training mm -hmm. for life, what sort of things did you pick up in that? Oh, gosh. I look back with so much gratitude for being a competitive swimmer. 
for so many reasons. I mean, my parents were amazing at driving me to and from swim practice all the time. What I loved about being a competitive swimmer was that I was never very good. And, and so it taught me how to be really like religiously committed to something, even if you weren't the best and not even just the best, like just not very excellent. Um, I also loved it, Graham. Like I didn't care that I wasn't the best. I just loved I loved it. I loved it so much. So that really helped. Um, just reframing doing something for the pure joy of it, you know? Mm. Um, I'm also grateful that I, I spent so much time in a bathing suit because I think, you know, as a woman, a girl going through puberty and being self-conscious and this and that, like, it was just great to, like, I felt like I grew up on a pool deck and, um, I just look and see there's so much around body image and whatnot. Mm. So that is something that I'm, I'm also grateful for. Um, some of my most cherished friendships were, were swimmers who I swam with for a long time. Um, and, and I'm biased and, and maybe too singularly focused, uh, on swimming, but you know, we would swim five to 10 kilometers a day and my longest race was only ever 800 meters. Mm -hmm. And I just think the, the work to re the work to race ratio is so great as a swimmer. Um, you know, I'll never, <laughs> I never run that much now. <laughs> I, mm. I used to swim more than I, I run. So, um, there were just so many excellent lessons and, and great takeaways that I'm really grateful for. Right. Did that teach you not to be scared of, not shy of work? Because it seems like you do work pretty hard and you're not scared to go out and do the work, right? And even if that means repeating something, you know, a hundred times, whatever it is, it seems that you, you were ingrained with that from an early age. And I'm wondering how that's also sort of transpired in your business life as well. Do, do you carry any kind of those lessons across to what you do in your business? Oh, gosh, of course. I mean, my favorite line is how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm. And I think that, you know, none of this has come without a lot of hard work. And I think something I'm probably most proud of is my ability to get over failure. And sometimes I don't even realize I've failed. I'm just like, oh, that didn't work. Try again. There's, you know, there's never maybe again to a fault, but I just don't know how to give up. And, mm. um, and, and I, again, I mean, so much is based around our egos and around looking good and, you know, do you want to impress someone or a company or this? And I would just rather admit, you know, you screwed up or it's not great and you're going to keep going and, and try again. And it's been the same with Iron Man, um, and, and business. I mean, I'm sure I could rhyme off countless examples of times that, you know, you think everything's lined up and it's going to be great and it's, you strike out and you go back up to bat and go again. And, um, yeah, sorry. I just don't think we have, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that whole thing is that you, you, you're quite comfortable with that fact that, you, you know, you are going to fail at some point and you just pick yourself up and do it again, which I think is, you know, it's quite inspiring, isn't it? Cause a lot of people, who maybe you know maybe they didn't have the sports training that you had or maybe they've lived in a, a salaried life for their career you know are not used to that situation where they're going to fail they try and avoid it but you put yourself mm -hmm. out there right that's how you sort of deal with that whole fear of failure right you just put yourself in that situation saying right okay i'm going to fail but i'm going to pick myself i'm going to you know i'm not going to it's failure is not fatal right i'm going to survive yeah. and live to be a better person as a result you know, I, I'm so fascinated by children and especially young children. We don't, we don't have any kids, but you know, watching kids learn how to walk or learn how to talk, like mm. they just keep going until they get it. And then all of a sudden something happens in our brains as teenagers or adults. And we just stop the relentless pursuit of trying. And it's really my only wish. My, my wish is to never lose enthusiasm on the path to continually trying. And I don't know, you can laugh at me along the way and I might be last along the way, but I'm having a lot of fun and I certainly <laughs> haven't lost my enthusiasm. 
Um, Nobody's laughing so, at you. They're laughing with you, I think, when they you know, read some of your race reports and, you know, 30-hour plane journeys and so on. I think you've got a lot of people on your side there, Steph. <laughs> I love this idea of like losing our relentless pursuit of trying. And something you mentioned already, I know you've mentioned it a couple of times about looking good. Now, this must be a lot harder for being a female growing up as a triathlete or growing up as just a female, full stop, right? Somebody who wanted to, you know, become an entrepreneur in later life, somebody who wanted to pursue their athletic dreams and so on. Um, it, I, I'm a guy. Explain it to me as if I don't understand because I'm not going to try and ex pretend that I can explain it for you. So how harder is it for you to do these things to become an entrepreneur to become a professional triathlete than it is for me, for example, as a guy trying to do that. Yeah. Well, what I will say is I actually don't know how hard or easy it is for a man. Um, but what I will say is in the world of sport, you know, across the board, participation levels for women in sport are just so much lower. And I think the the cost associated with that is – we don't grow up looking up to the same plethora of, of idols, if you will. You know, there just aren't as many women. And, I mean, the Boston Marathon was such a great example of, of the power of women on the start line. And I think you, you know, there's, there's self-conscious, um, you know, physical uh, pressure. Of, of how you look and I think as a woman you know you want to look up to whomever an idol or a mentor and want to look like them and the beautiful thing about women is that we're all shaped a million different ways and you might not look like that person and it doesn't mean that you're not you know your heart's not as big to go after something and then you also get to a point where you know in your adult life of women choosing a family or, or or not and those are different pressures and they impact things like do I continue to race as a professional triathlete or do I take mat leave and do I want a comfortable salary job so I can have a paid maternity leave in Canada and um you know these are decisions and and once upon a time, someone said, you know, you can have it all. You just have to choose what it all means to you. Mm. And I think that that is relevant for men and women. Um, but it would be remiss of me to say that I don't think, I mean, I think women are making really big calls, really big choices. And, I, you know, not to be a feminist, that mm. I think some of those choices might be easier for, for men along the way. Yeah. Um and so, again, not a knock on men, just from my perspective as a woman, I think it's important that we all continue to play the game, that yeah. we show up. And that sport and that can be business. I think, you know, you need women at the table making decisions if you're running a business. And if you don't have a woman there, you need to do something about that. Yeah. Um, There's no yeah. argument about the role and the efficacy of having women in business or sport, right? I think that that argument's been put to bed. I think we're all on the page with that. What I wonder about is, you know, that um, it's easy. I mean, for example, like say starting a business, it's easier for me as a guy because A, I've got a whole bunch of role models I can look to. Mm. You know, I mean, it's a lot harder. You have to dig deeper to find female role models. And that is not yeah. a result of lack of, you know, good women. It's a lack of yeah. the media wanting to cover the right people and so on, right? I mean, everybody knows about Mark Cuban, Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg, blah, 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 you know, exactly. But now you're sort of having to dig a bit deeper to find the women, right? So I think that really affects us. You talk about, you know, this relentless pursuit of trying. Well, trying is a lot easier when you've got somebody as a role model, as a kid, right? Say, so I want to yeah. be like that person. Like right? that person. Exactly. And in sport and in business, it's easy for us guys, right? But I mean, I look around it for women and I wonder, wow, how does it work for you guys? I mean, who did you look up to when you were a kid, you know, whether in sport or business or whatever, you know, that inspired you? And I wonder, do we, I, and I, I'm sort of jumping ahead of myself here, but I think you are one of those people that people will look up to as well. But we'll talk about that in a minute. But first you. As, you, as a kid. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, honestly, Graham, I would almost disagree because I don't think we've put the feminist conversation to bed. Mm. I mean, I think the reality is women don't make as much money. 
full stop. It's just the fact. And there aren't as many women. And so to your point, like there aren't as many role models, but there aren't as many people that are, that are playing the game. And I think being a self-expressed woman, um, is, is like, I don't want to be a man in this world. I want to be a woman. Um, I want to, you know, do sport like a woman and I want to show up in my business like a woman. And, um, I have a few, there are a few women that I do look up to. And quite frankly, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm more passionate about not critiquing people that are in the game because I think if you're in the game way to go um yet there are lots of women who I don't want to be like as well um and perhaps that's similar for you but to your point you have a larger sample set Hmm. to choose from um so yeah I guess ultimately it comes down to making really powerful choices and I'm most drawn to people who I believe are making choices or who I get to witness and experience making choices that are aligned to them living like their best best lives Mm. and um that can be family choices or or career choices or you know where you choose to live um but you're making a choice that's the point right a lot of people don't choose right they get chosen for them something you you wrote or you said before steph um I think it's fascinating. You said you struggle with people who think they have days to waste or dreams mm-hmm. to go unfulfilled. And this is from Inner Voice, which is Trav McKenzie's website, which was mentioned in the other day's podcast. What exactly are you talking about here? Yeah, oh, I love Trav. Um, that was a really special article because that, or post rather, that went out the, the week before my first Ironman win. And that was that was really neat because... Of course, it was a dream to, I mean, it was a really big, hairy goal to to win Ironman Canada last year. And um, it was one that I didn't tell many people. Um, it was sort of that secret hidden goal. Mm. But I think, I think sharing your dreams is a vulnerable act. And there's more people that will tell you why you can't do it than you can. And it's a lot easier to talk about things than it is to go out there and actually do it. And what I've learned is that no one actually cares <laughs> whether you do it or you don't. And so that's what I mean. Like, if you have a dream, then then freaking chase it. Because at the end of the day, I'm not sure people care if you do or you don't. And the person that matters the most is you. And like, so what are you doing? And again, like this isn't meant to sound cliche. It's just, if if somebody tells me, you know, like a year from now, I'm going to start this or that. I'm like, why waste a year? Like you can do it now. Hmm. And I just, I mean, I've been injured and I've been sidelined and you only need a few of those moments to think like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to have this moment in time. What can I do? Hmm. And, and that's all there is to it um so you will never ever hear me knock anyone's dream Hmm. yes Uh, on that note i want to get your advice for people who are sort of setting out on this journey as well because you've done something quite remarkable let's i mean you know every field that you've set out to you know apply yourself to you've done pretty well i mean in, in iron man you just turned pro. You've got a whole history of successes in that. You've got a, a great business, a great business partnership. You seem to be living your life on your terms. Okay. Now, one of the things you do is you put yourself out there and you do share your dreams from time to time. You're very honest with what you say in your writing as well, which is great and it's refreshing. But, and let me put the butt in here, I imagine you must attract criticism at some point or some kind of doubts from some people they may say something i'm just wondering does that happen how does it happen how do you deal with it because you know i don't want to talk about the critics per se because we don't want to give them any airtime. i just want to you know give advice to people who may be setting out to say look you you know as, as bulletproof as you may be 
you know, you have to accept that not everybody is going to get it, that this is how you deal with those people, because then you can save time for people who really count. How does that work with you? Do you get that kind of criticism or do people sort of mm, not sure about what you're doing? Or how does that work with you? Um, I am sure the critic list is mighty long and I do my very best to not listen to it ever. Um, I, I, I think it comes back honestly, Graham to like a very tight inner circle. Um, and, and I would never, ever want to paint the picture that I think that I'm so great <laughs> um, by any means. Uh, it's more that I actually feel, frankly, scared every day and super vulnerable. And when you're in that state, um, it's quite raw feeling. And so you will surround yourself by people that, you know, that, that believe the dream too. Or otherwise, I kind of feel like I'm in a bit of a cocoon um, because the world is harsh and people are mean and – and people are jerks. <laughs> um, um, so, so I think, you know, hold the tribe tight, stay in a cocoon. And at the end of the day, like it's the same thing. The ones, what is that great quote? The, the, the critic that doesn't count. Um, I haven't met one critic that does count. Mm. Or the Seth yeah. Godin quote, they don't build statues to critics, right? Uh, it's, it's quite easy uh, to, I, well, Exactly. Stay on the sidelines and snipe. But, you know, there's a lot of people who, who are listening to your story who will be inspired, like me. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of people will, you know, this will be a seed planted in their head where they want to make change in their own lives. Um, but I, I'm sort of struggling with this idea of becoming scared and super vulnerable, which you've chosen. I, I, I'm just wondering if people can get themselves into that situation. Why would somebody choose to scare the crap out of this themselves? Why would somebody choose to become super vulnerable when they may have a good job? You know, they may have family, they may have mortgage, etc., etc. Why now? I want to do what you do. But would I then choose to become vulnerable in this situation? What's the upside of this? Well, you know, I think the only thing that matters and what should certainly be stated is, I don't don't think everyone should go and quit their job. I think there people, not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur and, and people need to work for really great organizations doing great things in the world. I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that what matters most is that you know where you want to go in your life and what matters most along the way. And then that you're making choices that are aligned to that. So if 10 years from now, this is the life if I want to live, what are you doing every day to craft that life? And if, if what you're doing today doesn't align or take you closer to where you want to be 10 years from now, then I think you need to do something about that. And what I can say is that 10 years ago, I probably wrote out a vision that, that I am living right now. Um, and, you know, when I look down the runway of life, I think, if this is my last year on the planet, I am doing my highest calling, what makes my heart beat the fastest with the people I love the most. And that is really my wish for everyone. And it, I don't think everyone is meant to be scared every day. Yet I've gone from being really grateful and really happy to feeling really comfortable. And I thought, you know, on the other side of those feelings, is this feeling of, of being scared. And what I've learned about myself is that though those moments of being scared generate new feelings for me of being grateful and really happy and really fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the place that I like to go to. And that doesn't mean it's for everyone. Um, I just wish that we wouldn't take our adult brains that tell us to be boring and fit in and <laughs> give them so much airtime. Exactly. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, that's very good. I mean, yeah, it's interesting that you say that these feelings go together as well. Being like super happy comes with being 
scared and vulnerable, right? You've got to have both of them rather than comfortably numb, I suppose. It's like the, the middle track, yeah. which is the, the, the adult brain kicking in, right? So just out of curiosity, did you, you just said there that you, 10 years ago, you had visualized this or you'd written it out or something. Did, was that something that you consciously thought of? You said, right, I'm going to live this kind of life. Or like you said earlier, you can have it all if you choose what that it all means, right? Did you yeah. sit down with yourself? What, what was the actual process there? What happened for you kind of decided that this is what you wanted? Yeah, I will give Chip Wilson all of the credit for this. Chip Wilson is the founder of Lululemon. And um, it was 10 years ago that I started at Lululemon. And one of our exercises on our first day was crafting your 10 year vision, and then working on goals that were aligned to creating a life that you love. And that involved um, everything from your work life to your personal life. And um, also your sweat life, your health. And uh, yeah, my life looked very different 10 years ago. Um, but when I look at my life now, it, it was but a dream that I had written down on a piece of paper my first week at Lululemon. Mm, wow. So does it match up between what you wrote down and how it is now? Honestly, Graham, it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> But that's such a powerful exercise, isn't it? I mean, if people would take one thing away from this interview today with you, it, just to do that alone would have a mm. profound effect on your life. People don't even think like that. I mean, you talk about the, the normal, boring adult brain. Yeah. We don't think like that, right? For a whole different number of reasons, right? But a lot of people don't even do this exercise. But you do this. Do you still do it? Are you doing it now for the future? Oh, I'm obsessed. I do it all the time. Um, sometimes 10 years out is too far. Sometimes I find it better to to do it in shorter chunks. Um, it, it just depends on, on where things are at in life. Uh, but, you know, to your point in speaking about the adult brain, I had a really good friend that that was doing his um, MBA at, let's just call it a rep very reputable American mm -hmm. university. Um, and the entire MBA was focused around creating bucket lists. And I was like, what the heck is this? Like, you guys are executives traveling from around the world to attend this, you know, exceptional MBA program. And the whole concept was that these executives had lost the ability to dream and create a life for themselves. And and they were so caught up in just serving a business um, that that they weren't even able to imagine their lives beyond that. And the reality is that they were doing this exercise so that they could practice imagining the business beyond where the business was. But if they couldn't do it for their own lives, then they couldn't bring that as a contribution to the business. And, you know, for a long time, I was self-conscious and I wouldn't have wanted to share with you that, you know, I had a 10 year vision and I have, I have all these goals because you might judge me and I might fail at them and then I won't look good. And, you know, then I start not caring about what other people think. And that's very helpful. And then I hear things like, you're paying $100,000 a year to do a program that's just asking you to articulate your vision or your dreams. Like, there really is some legitimacy to this. And my hope as adults is that we never lose our curiosity or, like I said, you know, our enthusiasm to to try new things. And that's – there's a $100,000 MBA program for you in 30 <laughs> – <laughs> that's harsh but i love it that must be the harsh <laughs> advice as well there was a moment of silence when that bit of advice sunk in but it's so on the nail steph it's so true but wow amazing I, you've been an inspiration and i've really enjoyed talking to you i'm curious i can't let you go without some kind of idea of what's coming up in your world because you've had so mm -hmm. many exciting adventures and I don't believe this is the end of it. There's a lot more to come, right? Just give us a flavor of what's coming up. I don't want a 10 year vision. Just give us something <laughs> a lot shorter. What's coming up in the near future for you, Steph? Yeah, near future. So um, there's two really exciting things happening. Um, within our business, we created an online manager training program because we believe that an exceptional manager can change your life. And we have been working on this program um, or sharing this 
Master's program, I should say, within North America. And we are officially translating this and going global um, and taking it to the world. So, you know, when you create a product and you have a vision here in Vancouver and now you get to spread it around the around the world, um, that's really exciting. Mm, so exciting. not only will – sorry? Exciting times. That's manager start line, isn't it? The manager start line. Exactly. Yeah. Let's give it some. So credit. we're very excited about that from a, a professional perspective, and um, from a triathlon perspective, I am actually off um, twelve weeks from today. Uh, I am headed to Roth, Germany, for oh, yeah. Challenge Roth. Um, so I'm very, very excited to tow that line. I'm sure there will be a stacked field. Um, and then I'm returning home to race back on home turf at Ironman Canada. Um, and, uh, so the month of July, I will have two, two pretty big races and, um, you know, if, if I can be so bold, I am going to put some pretty relentless focus to the next 15 weeks of training and, uh, and hope to surprise myself and maybe some sponsors along the way. <laughs> yes, you sure will. And we can follow your journey as well. Where can we find out more about you, Steph? Yeah, stephcorker.com. Um, across all social platforms, I'm Steph underscore Corker uh, or the CorkerCompany.com as well. I guess Google. There's this <laughs> engine called Google and Steph Corker. We've heard Corker. about it, yeah. Corker. Yeah, it will give you all things Steph Corker. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you and hearing about your journey and your travails, your adventures. I think you've inspired a lot of listeners, you know, to make change, to be a player rather than a spectator in this game of life. You know, how Amen. difficult that is as well. And just, you know, the importance of just setting goals for yourself. And let's not forget the power of the people, the company that you keep and how that influences. Yeah. Because that is the really the base that gives you the strength to go out and be bold, isn't it? Because you it's can... so true. You know, you are so unafraid of putting yourself out there or maybe you, you do get a little bit scared but you able to do it with confidence and <laughs> you know that without that you won't inspire other people right so mm. it's a loss everybody loses at the end of the day the critics win yeah we don't want that right <laughs> hey that's don't steph let them win. yeah exactly no. <laughs> steph corker everybody she is a people consultant coach and freshly minted professional triathlete heading to challenge roth so we're going to check out that journey as well follow you when you come back to ironman canada as well and we wish you all the best you know really it's been an exciting journey talking to you today and we want to find out what's going on in the future so please come back onto the show in future steph and share with us an update wherever you are in the world whatever you're doing we would love to be part of that journey with you. That's Steph Corker, everybody. Steph, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. So, so grateful. Thanks, Graham. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.